Um, so it's with great pleasure that I'm able to introduce our first keynote speaker for today, Peg Rose. And if you have any questions for Peg, um, please put them in the, uh, the chat on the YouTube on the right hand side. Peg Ross is a professor of architecture and philosophy at the Bartlett School of Architecture at UCL. Peg trained in art history and philosophy and her work focuses on material, political, technology and art. And her talk today is entitled Kind Matters, Situated, Responsible Interactions. Thanks. If you're able to share Thanks your Thanks so much, Carmen. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so can you see my screen? Carmen? Yeah. You can, can see my screen? Yes. And you can hear me? Yes. Fine, okay, thanks so much. So thank you so much to Ruth, Carmen and Ben for this um, really fascinating invitation. And thank you so much for Ben and Carmen and Ruth's um, introduction, which are really important, um, obviously for me to really kind of sense how I'm going to be placed into your conversation. So um, just before I begin with the, the um, presentation, just to say I'm really aware that my conversation is going to come from some other different domains that you have already been talking about. And I want to really stress that these are here to be constructive and to um, enable and to engage with your discussions. Please don't take my conversations as um, critical of the work that you're doing. I think it's amazing and um, very, very impressive. So I really want to just um, preface my, my talk with that. So thank you so much for this invitation. My talk is going to draw from my own interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary thinking between the arts, humanities and sciences. And in the way that Ben and Ruth have suggested, I'm also going to be thinking about the way in which architecture is operating often at very lived scales of reality, but not at the standard forms of science or art or of um, humanism that we might potentially still see around us in some of our areas of work. Some of the scales and objects of research are distinctly human here. Um, and this is where I want to uh, suggest that my conversation is meant to be connective rather than um, something that dismisses what you are all already talking about. But I want to highlight that I'm placing these relations into the context because of their impact on the concept of design and how we design for society, for the industry, for the public's communities and for our individuals, but also this point that's been made in much of the conversation just now about the planetary scale, the concept of home and for where we live. And of course, this talk of this um, series is taking place within the context of COP26 um, that the UK is hosting and in the sense of the need for intergenerational, international and governmental agreement um, on how to intervene and to engage with the climate crisis through the industry, but also culturally and socially and planetarily. So my talk here is really to think about matters of kind, that is architecture and design thinking, which requires the consideration of our relationship to our living material habitats and cohabitations. And I want to work and think through with you some effective ethical and what I would call passionate reasoning, which is required. How you might think about these kind matters of the more than human, of the non-human, of our kinships and of kindness and care, which underpin the contemporary interdisciplinary architectural and social practice, societal practices. Within the context of COP26 and the second year of our pandemic, and our house being on fire. Architecture and the built environment are under a great deal of scrutiny as disciplines and professions, or even sciences, that are distinctly social and concerned with the welfare of their environment, through which life, difference, biodiversity, and also death are intertwined. And I want to take you back to a week after the Grenfell Tower in 2017, when a colleague, Camilla Boano, gave me his book to read, An Ethics of Potential Urbanism. He considers 
Giorgio Gambon's political writings on art, architecture and society, and Gambon's image of a house on fire. Quote, it's only in the burning house that the fundamental architectural problem becomes visible for the first time. Art at its furthest point of destiny makes visible its original project. And as I read these words four years ago, they vibrated and blurred alongside the long days of being immersed in images and reports, films and voices of the Grenfell community's physical distress. And I mentioned that notion of the long days of being immersed in images. I think it's so much a part of where we are now today still. The community's horrific loss of home and family, the neglect of residential life resonated and is still resonating with those of us who may be paying attention to the public inquiries, witness statements, and the exposure of corporate malpractice and building technologies, failings in regulation, local authority, uh, mis uh, misresponsibility, engineering and architectural lack of responsibility or failings. The much repeated phrase at this time was duty of care, and really it did point very strongly, very poignantly and rather dramatically to the systematic decline in housing welfare in the British society over the past 40 years. And a phrase which I think now does still resonate again within the context of climate emergency and issues of social inequality, including the very fundamental Black Lives Matter. But my work comes from a number of different contexts, and one is the 17th century philosopher of life, Baruch Spinoza, who pro produces writing and thinking where reasoning is not confined just to our intellectual powers. For him, instead, reasoning, or what he might call what we might call rational thinking, which is often very associated with science and technological, uh, and also I think sometimes architectural endeavor, instead is for Baruch, is for Spinoza distinct and is lived from corporeal and societal experience. And this is in his text, The Ethics from 1677, so before the very grand enlightenment phase of the 18th century, when ideas about reason, legal power, sense of subjectivity in society really become codified into institutions. Instead, before this time, Spinoza, living in a very strong neoliberal period of early neoliberal period of uh, speculative housing, of large urbanization, suggests that the power of reasoning is intimately connected to our situated human experience and expression. He directly relates it to our effective corporeal capacities and powers, and thus for our ability to produce ethical uh, senses of self, self-care and also of society. Reasoning is for him then a consequence of this transversal and transitory experience of per perception and affect, and leads him to suggest that nature, mind and the body have an equity these are equities of powers that construct our society and also our individual agency. And what I draw from this is a really in, um, thoughtful set of discussions that he poses around the notion that reasoning can be passionate, passionate reasoning. This is the site to which we locate ourselves, our personal, but also our societal welfares and care of ourselves. And I would suggest this is the kind of practice that I think is something that seems to have a resonance with the work of colleagues here today. Of course, the intersections between the scientific and the artful and the social are really in quite a still a state of severe uncertainty, especially when we think of the need for scientific, governmental and corporate action. And this comments again of colleagues who were just speaking. There is a great fear of change, loss of power and the actual material transformation of the planet and our resources and of our lives, and also of the inertia of political and corporate governance. But I want to, in the way that colleagues just have, also take you out of the modern studio of architectural subjectivity and objectivity. Take you away from this idea of the expert authority of the artist or so architect or scientist to consider these as matters of kind within the context of process, ethics, and also vulnerability. Also with respect to the COVID pandemic and the climate crisis. And this is where I'm locating my own work, which is drawing from materialist, ecological and feminist. And I think now what we might well want to suggest is intersectional senses of self and of power and equity. These are practices which I construct within an architectural context of teaching and researching, more with humanities architectural researchers at the moment than with designers, but ones in which we explore corporeal passionate modes of reasoning. And these are the ones that I want to sort of highlight have taken place in the previous collaborations and work that I've undertaken with others. So Relational Architecture of Colleges is a text uh, collaboration that focuses on the sciences of the social, 
And these contributions come from economics, from law, public health, philosophy. On the right, there's poetic biopolitics, which presents the work of colleagues in architecture together with the arts, poetry, film, and theatre. Across both these projects, I put architecture into a companion with others to ask questions about life and ways of being. And this is the notion of ontology rather than epistemology. Um, people may want to comment on this. It may be that the discussion of epistemology has been very strong, the notion of what is knowledge um, in previous discussions this week. But I want to um, insert the fact that a lot of my work is about ontology, which is about ways of being, ways of living, rather than notions of ways of knowing. And partly, this is also to insert the notion of human difference back into matter, to insert difference into the matrix of matter, of economy, and oikos, and ecology. And this is where conversations about the human to the non-human come into play. And I'm not alone here. We have many, many colleagues and individuals in architecture and also in other disciplines doing this. But I think it is also important here to sort of highlight the point that these are um, interests in responsibility and ethical interactions. And also, of course, in relation to the work that's taking place in this, um, in this research project with colleagues, the examination of how to engage and to directly act upon resource depletion and issues of extraction, issues of reuse and use, and also of the ethics of technology, scientific and economics to coming together. Now, these are not new, and I'm sure this is something that's come up in uh, the previous days. Feminist and political philosophy, sometimes also called feminist new materialism, understands these questions as aesthetics, which are sciences of the sensibility. And this notion of sciences and sensibility also goes back to historically to some of these earlier thinkers of aesthetics. Practices in which the world and its matters, in architecture, buildings, bodies and ecologies, are constituted through specific material relations and rather than disembodied scientific reasoning. Instead, reasoning is always embodied. It's located in specific times, histories, spaces and places and it's undertaken by specific people communities and individuals which question the normative human, humanist and universalist histories and ideas and for those of you who um, are not familiar with some of this uh, terminology i would say that this is perhaps one of the key elements to these kinds of practices is that it is questioning the notion of standardized concepts of what it means to be human i think these are something we're all living with actually very strongly today as some of my talk later on might uh, begin to indicate. But these are also to indicate the fact that historical practices are part of this and in a way that historical practices are also very close to notions of science and of architecture and of subjectivity. And of course this is where people like Rachel Carson and Diane Harray are exemplary practitioners. Carson's brilliant fieldwork that uses the mythical voice of storytelling to talk about our anthropocentric changes in the world around us, although she doesn't of course use that term. But I want to highlight here as well, Carson is important within these discussions for her, um, for being rejected by the standards of scientific practice around her, but also because of her death from cancer, which I think resonates again with the questions around humane and non-humane life that we may feel more pertinently today, particularly within the pandemic. Haraway's witty transformative companion species is one that many of us have found huge amount of inspiration for its celebration of the kinness, of the kindness of the non-human. Each of these practitioners, their scientists, philosophers, and I think collaborators and members of society and uh, communities in which they operated, were knowingly, I think, um, colleagues who present uh, the planetary relation as well as the human together. Both feminist artful scientists who also, to my mind, practice what um, Rosie Bajotti has called critical form of sympathy. That is, they are located within and for contaminated histories. And this is where also I would want to draw from Haraway's 1997 Modest Witness, where she points out very um, artfully, I think, but very, very importantly, that we are kin of a techno-scientific revolution that has emancipated, but has also colonized and created wretched inequality. Now, this relationship between artful science and writing is something that I think, again, is very pertinent today. And these are writers of science who also use sometimes mythical, sometimes economic, sometimes biological and historical and social political thinking. 
they come after Carson and Haraway, to my mind. And while they are not necessarily strictly concerned with the biological in the way that some of the work that people are talking about during this week might be, I want to highlight that, for example, the 1972 publication by Donella Meadows and all the limits to growth, a report for the Club of Rome's project on the predicament of mankind, is a really fascinating critique of the notion of pure acceleration and of our reliance upon notions of infinite oil and coal and economic science of the time. And I think this is the point to just highlight. There was critique at the time that maybe sometimes we don't necessarily quite pay attention to. This critique of fossil fuels inextricably linked also to our present day questions of life and non-life, of vulnerability, of extinction and of biodiversity. Elizabeth Colbert's great sixth extinction, extinction, learning also from Carson's mythical storytelling of the loss of species and of vulnerability. And then also more recently, colleagues, geologists, geographers, Simon Lewis and Mark Maslin, who write the history of the Anthropocene, underlying how scientific, economic and political extractions of value of the environment have directly impacted on animal and human life but also particularly with their attention to the greatest intensity and the beginning of this transformation of this, um, of this devastation since the 16th century capture of ground for agricultural capital. And I think this is an interesting book because it places them alongside actually some political philosophers and geographers like uh, Jason Moore in a way that perhaps when you come across these colleagues in other circumstances, you might suggest they may not have that kind of accord. And then finally, the work of Catherine McKittrick, whose critical race theory reconfigures the relationship between the modern individual, the modern social experience of science and subjectivity, and who places um, the relationship between the non-human of the black individuals of black communities in respect to racial capitalism and science, but rather done through a rather beautiful, poetic, um, reflexive set of writings. So rather than excluding science from these discussions of ontology, I would suggest that these are all interesting and important notions for architects to be aware of with the situated and life story. And I place these here also to highlight that history is not, and I'm sure this is not uh, unfamiliar to many of you, and has never been a neutral science. History is always part of an aspect of political imagination. And now, as I think is painfully present to us again in advanced capitalist societies in which ecological um, and uh, biological and human life are also very strongly intervened by ideological and economic constituencies who do take exclusionary and divisive um, interests to their heart. And I would suggest that instead, by extension, architectural design can, and I think this project here is showing us how it is developing understandings of the need to de need to work together and not to repeat the alienations of some of these um, previous generations. But these generations are still very strong, and I think there's something that uh, we need to be mindful about. So I want to highlight now about some of the ways in which I've been experiencing writing and returning and thinking through some of the um, projects in architectural um, context that I've been working with. Last spring, I was asked to write about scientific representation in architecture for a Chilean architectural journal. And when I returned to the work after the lockdown in April, and having experienced the virus myself, including some of the long, slow tail of symptoms, my visual, the visual vocabularies of life and science that I'd previously been looking at and thinking about in quite a different way changed as a result of the relationship between my circumstances, but more the planetary resonance of those before the pandemic. In particular, I return to the historical geopolitical maps of energy use by Buckminster Fuller. And excuse me, my computer has just shut down. So I'm just going to pause and have to reboot. Apologies, everyone. OK, I'm back. Apologies for that. Um, so I return to the maps by Buckminster Fuller, the energy slave maps that were produced by him between the 1940s and 50s. And these were, um, I think, are, are perhaps unusual in some of his work for being utopian global visualizations of data, which really draw attention to the use of fossil fuels. And in fact, they're really interested in proposing a post-war acceleration of energy market. 
Now they were seen as very effective and very um, desirable by some of the um, individuals involved in designing US geopolitics at the time, and he produced them for Fortune magazine, amongst others. But what I wanted to draw attention to is the way in which Fuller uses the term energy slave as a cipher for robotic or mechanized energy capacity in these projections. And in so doing, I think, reveals the disturbing visual vocabulary of slavery and of the colonial history of racism. Although Fuller was trying to produce a humanization in a way to kind of evacuate or rethink this term, I think it's an example of a, an approach that now we would see as being very problematic. And in a way, I want to highlight that I think Ruth's point about how your project is building towards uh, different kinds of diversity and sense of community is a signal that we are in a different place for this. Nevertheless, Fuller is used very strongly still by many in the, in the um, dis discipline as a very um, important example of a utopic post-war um, architect. More recently, of course, Catherine Yusuf's Billion Black Anthropocenes has taken up this issue of planetary racism in a very powerful decolonizing critique about this blindness of science to the politics and history and lived experience of black populations. Now, more recently, within our context of the um, pandemic and within the context of the UK being in its third wave, amongst the many other kind of questions of uh, the pandemic that we're experiencing in the, in the world, I think there are questions about the relationship between certainty, authority, expertise, and vulnerability, which are operating and ones which I, um, I want to draw attention to now in the next part of the talk. These are questions that obviously at governmental and societal levels, and they bring into contact scientific information and corporeal infrastructures. I think we could call these infrastructures or actually even architectures as well as health systems or biomes. And these are really now operating at a very, um, I think, intense everyday scale, as well as at these larger scales. But nevertheless, they're ones where I think there's quite a large degree of denial in some of the more public discussions about how these visualizations and if you like these architectures are presenting the notion of this experience of this um, transformation of the globe and of communities and uh, individuals. And in some ways, I want to highlight that this is a particular uh, proximate form of human nature relations, what someone might call humanimal um, relations because of the impact of the illness uh, and its transmission from animal to human. Now, within an architectural set of scales, we can obviously observe there have been some very uh, notable um, developments here. We've had the um, hospital design, the Wuhan hospitals that were built within days, and also uh, much more um, unimpressively, the UK redundant Nightingale hospitals which uh, those of you may already know that quite a large degree of cynicism about these ex exists in the NHS, because it was very clear to those who worked in the NHS that they were not the staff who were ever going to be able to support these kinds of additional infrastructures uh, beyond the UK hospital setting. But of course, one of the other infrastructures, which is not visible here, but is one that I think has been very, very strong in our minds for the last few months, is the infrastructure of oxygen, its use, the supply and lack of it, as in the case for the appalling um, experience of the Indian population recently. And this kind of vulnerability is something that I think is changing the way in which we're thinking about these human and non-human relations. But of course, the issue of oxygen and of breath is something that really does speak to the question that Black Lives Matter and the I Can't Breathe protests after George Floyd's murder last year. In addition, we'd of course have the vaccine um, infrastructure, this kind of biological discussion happening, which links between large scale corporate interest of pharmaceutical gain and also government uh, bad faith and bad practice. Where old stories of advantage and nationalism of North global priorities are being played out in really grim and very unpleasant manners. But I also want to highlight another kind of infrastructure here. And this is one which in some ways is an old one, a bit more modest. And this is some of the discussion around dexamethasone, a synthetic adrenal corticoid, corticosteroid, which has potent anti-inflammatory properties. And I want to suggest that this is one which is an example of a different kind of scale of infrastructure, a pharmaceutical one, 
but one that links also the COVID experience back to some of the other experiences of vulnerability, which we live with, and that is the treatment of cancer, particularly blood cancers. So last year in June 2020, the Lancet reported the results of the uh, dexamethasone test and of its uh, contribution to supporting um, individuals who are on respiratory um, respirators um, with failing oxygen levels or needing ventilation. Although dexamethasone is not one that can be used when uh, an individual is not receiving external ventilation, it's one which I want to highlight has a number of different properties which I think in some ways perhaps show the way in which or perhaps might correspond to some of the discussions about the transversal, the transversal practices that are happening in the project um, that we are talking about today. The dexamethasone is used to treat cancer itself, it reduces inflammation, can reduce sickness, it can improve appetite. But I also want to highlight it's a drug that has as well as a, a suppressant of the immune system, so this capacity for the um, organism to the individual to fight disease is reduced. It also produces a very strong um, impact on the mood swings, on the emotional experience of the individual during treatment. Now I'm linking this discussion to feminist philosophers, for example, Judith Butler, who's writing about vulnerability is one that I found very important in the last uh, few months or the, the last year or so. Butler talks about vulnerability as characterizing a relation to a field of objects, forces and passions that impinge or affect us in some way. And in a manner that I would suggest accords with some of the work that I've been doing about relational architectures, she continues by saying, we think the relationship between the human body and infrastructure to call into question the body is discrete, singular and self-sufficient. And to understand embodiment as both performative and relational, where relationality includes dependency on infrastructural conditions and legacies of discourse and institutional power that precede and condition our existence. Close quote. Together with Butler, I've been reading again the work of Julian Howey, a British philosopher, who also examines the potential of critical materialist expression. And I'm really sorry, my computer has just paused again. Apologies, everyone. This is not what I had planned. Sorry. If you need, Peg, I can share um, a copy of the slides if it doesn't. Oh, I think that would life. be brilliant, actually, Peter. No sorry, worries. Because I am finding my battery for some reason is not can you, um, stable. Can you let me know what slide number you're on? Um, I oh, am... seven. I've just spotted it. So do you want me to stop sharing? You'll pick up. Uh, yeah, why don't you stop sharing and then I will um, share just one moment. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm on this slide, which is of. Um... Don't worry, Peg, we're, we're all. I'm not worried. I'm sorry for everyone else. This is just tedious. But obviously, <laughs> this is kind of where we're in. I've yeah. got a vulnerable slideshow, or rather, a vulnerable <laughs> Word document. No, um, don't worry. So apologies, everyone. But let me just, if you don't mind, I'm just actually going to go from the. Can we see this on screen now, everybody? Yeah. So you should have. Um, if you don't mind, you need to have um, stay with the dexamethasone and hospital slide, Peter. So is it slide seven? Is that the one you've got? It's just just move back. It doesn't matter too much. Sorry, I've got um, I've got a, a the PDF document that you sent me this morning. Um, this is the the, the right ten one. slides. That's fine. Yeah, no, you're there. Okay, okay, cool. Thank you so much. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. Apologies. I can't okay. just gather myself back to the right place. Um, okay, so I'll just begin that section again. So Gillian Halley is another of these feminist philosophers who's interested in the uh, relationship between material expression and reason. And I also refer to her because she is a philosopher who herself died from cancer in 2013. And in one of her late lectures, which was a lecture that was for research students, so not seen as a kind of therapeutic context, but one of the contexts in which her field of work and her contribution to the leadership team that she undertook in PhD research at Liverpool, 
She brings together critical theory and life stories, what we might also call phenomenology. I don't know if phenomenology has been a, a term that's come up in the previous uh, days, but her aim is to think about life stories, to demystify the discrimination of the vulnerable, but also to affirm it as singular and collective agency of the communities and those who engage and are part of these experiences. So I want to highlight there's a very strong sense of affirmation here. It's not just about a concept of, um, of the negative. And instead, she produces a critical sympathy, which embodies the political and the poetic agencies of those who live with disability, with long term chronic or other uh, disadvantages. And of the understandings that exist that can be transferred to the professional or to the personal context within the sense that we might now call caregiving practices. So I draw from her a very interesting kind of reflection on the way in which the actual lived experience of the individual, which may not be the standard universal subject, is one that actually we, we may be able to draw from. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So although Harry's insights about living with life-limiting illnesses rethink subjectivity towards him, the human, I want to sort of highlight the way in which she um, brings together an approach to thinking about storytelling and the possible sense of diaries or of logging the way in which we think. And this is um, also in the context of us thinking about these life stories about living with, as I think uh, Ben was talking about, the notion that your projects are looking at how we live with these how we live with these experiences, but also the potential of that diagnosis. And in some ways, I'm suggesting that there's a way in which we have diagnosed uh, much more perhaps comprehensively, or there's a sense of collaborative shared experience of diagnosis of climate change and of the climate crisis, but also of social inequality. And also I think drawing from the pandemic experiences, that we may be able to perhaps take these kinds of uh, uh, experiences to think about the disease, that is the disease or the disease of climate change that could lead to more decisive agency in action, to living with and engaging and enabling others' environments. And this is where our work is one of perhaps of, um, creating living spaces that are have a kind of reasoning that's not heroic or utopic rationalism, but ones which are affirmative and critical incisive and hopeful. And on the screen here, we've got the, um, the stem cell transplant diary of the British artist Tom Corby. So Corby produces a, um, in his work, Blood and Bones, Metastasizing Culture, which was a project begun in 2013 and continued through for a number of years, visually charting the daily modulations of living for extended periods of self-isolation whilst going through oncology treatment. And what we have here is how his body produces an effective psychological and physiological set of data and information. Data recorded during the treatment known as PAD, a combination of three drugs, one inclu including dexamethasone, which preceded the stem cell transplant. And the graphs graphs in front of you show the rise and fall of his immune system response to blood platelet production during the treatment as well as the experience of his uh, treatment emotionally. So though not predictive, these are images that I think can be perhaps seen as effective visualizations of living with a life-limiting illness, but also the artist's body as a producer of data or information. In this respect, I think it's an example where we have the implication of the human and of the individual with these other kinds of matters of life. Could you go to the next slide, please? So here I'm suggesting that we have data visualizations of life, which are part of our everyday visual imagery of national healthcare and governmental experience of dealing with the pandemic at the moment. We're much more proximate to them. And of course, we're still in process. This is still an experience which we are living and is transforming us um, much, a great deal already still and for some time to come. These are also, I think, important counters to the idea of the biopolitical governmental arguments of following the science and highlight, nevertheless, how these are ideological framings where we can still have figures of certainty that can be presented and we need to learn how to engage or critique or position ourselves um, in contrast to some of these discussions, which can be very problematic for individuals trying to work at different scales. <clears throat> 
but I want to highlight, I think they're also really interesting approaches to thinking about how we engage and collaborate and come to know ways and to share information for different generations and to different communities. And I would say this is particularly obviously perhaps in the context of teaching and of research cultures, which recognize their um, temporality and of their process-based uh, working practices. But I also want to highlight that in some ways I am speaking today really about the involuntary experience of writing and of thinking and thinking about research today, which is really involving the projecting back and forth between contemporary works by practitioners, but also back into historical periods of um, certainty and uncertainty. And in some ways I want to highlight that nevertheless, although these are poignant, I think perhaps I've highlighted the fragility of some of this work, I want to suggest that these are actually, I think, really potentially quite powerful ways for thinking about how we go ahead from here, rather than falling into some of the traps of the utopian architectural endeavour that some of us may feel have um, not necessarily given us so much quality to take from where we are now. Um, final slide, please. So I want to close here with the work of Agnes Dennis. Um, Agnes Dennis, an environmental artist, who in the decade after Earthrise, produced a series of drawings called Isometric Systems, map projections, which I think in some ways still produce some of our contemporary planetary preoccupations with the spatial, the lived, the biological understandings of, our, of the world. And of the formation of our local and social relations, particularly as they may be presented in scientific visualizations, and also in light of some of the powers of addiction, both positive and negative, that are taking place within relationship to climate emergency and also of societal equality and inequality. Each map by Dennis deploys global and social information. Again, these are bodies of knowledge. What alien, that's right, excuse me, what Dennis called herself alien projections which sought to transpose the earth into a series of geometric figurations. Each of these oscillating between an identifiably mathematical object and an everyday global foodstuff or organic artifact, a snail, an egg, a lemon, a donut, a hot dog. What we could call another aesthetics of taste that defamiliarizes the taxonomies of kind and of denature standards of human, animal and planetary relations and scales. And perhaps we could suggest that this is a practice of this kind of matter, a science of the sensibility, in which the world and its matters and its architectures of continents, oceans, bodies and ecologies suggest otherwise. I would suggest these are the transversal relations rather than disembodied scientific objects. And that's responsible for interactions, which can then be critical tools for examining the importance of the political, social and planetary forms of ecological evidence and of our architectural lived everyday, lived everyday experiences. So I want to sort of close with the sense that I hope I've given you a sense of architecture and its companion species, its companion disciplines, which may then also take their experience and their understanding of historical production of material um, difference, but also give us the potential to think about how we can contribute to the way in which architecture can aid um, and engage with new vocabularies across our discipline for our academic, our public, our industrial, our social, our um, generational um, colleagues and communities. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Peg. That was such an interesting and really thought provoking talk. Um, I've picked up some, some great ideas, some new reading material for the summer as well. <laughs> um, the, uh, the term of passionate reasoning is something I haven't heard before, um, and I really like that idea. And I think you expanded that to this idea of bringing life story, implicitly the values of people into um, relational architectures is something that I think is really important for our work and I just wondered um, if you might be able to comment on this idea of how can we bring uh, these other these other values and ideas from external people into the work that we're doing the, how can we uh, integrate this more into these um, experimental prototypes Thanks, Carmen. So I can see that there's also questions coming in which are really about the, the kind of practical 
sense of the if you like the science and the biotechnological expertise being open to and having a generosity or an ability to have others taking part um i think that i mean it seems to me that the project is really taking that at its core as saying this has to be collaborative and where the notion of the expert has to give way to doubt and to question about its success so it seems to me that um this is something which will mean that the prototyping and the emphasis that is placed on prototyping is absolutely integral. But it's also perhaps about the results, isn't it? It's about how the representation and the concept of knowledge that is produced by the project actually recognizes that it may, it may be partial. These are these sort of perhaps these half objects and these senses of um, also, I think architecture not returning to these utopic agendas of success or of self-affirmation. Um, and in a way, this is why I wanted to mention the work of someone like Buckminster to Fuller, who I think is often seen as a very powerful historical uh, member of this community, um, very radical, very full of alterity and humanism, but actually potentially still seen as someone who I think doesn't necessarily move into that sense of collaborative community. Um, oriented experience. The other one I would just highlight, and I think maybe Ben and you or Ruth might want to comment on this, it seems to me that you're proposing that there is the need for a longitudinal study where the, the, the OM is going to potentially move to other kinds of prototype where it isn't just about a short term project, there needs to be this long term um, analysis and reflection. Um, so I do think it is about scientific method. It is really, it's not just about the idea you collaborate, it's actually how you constitute the sense of that discipline. Um, I'll pause there. That and do you want to talk to longitudinal? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's absolutely vital. Um, maybe not the initial prototype, of course it's very hard work um, and takes a lot of obviously takes a lot of time to carry out longitudinal studies um, and a lot of resources. So, you know, I think it makes sense to develop things initially um, in a sort of a quicker cycle. But then at some point, you, you have to have longitudinal studies. I mean, I've, I've been involved in work before looking at people's reactions to different materials, um, which is something we're very interested in with biomaterials and how people respond to those materials. Um, and there's no substitute for people living with those materials and really embedding it within their within their lives. You know, because if you just show someone a material sample and they go, oh, that's nice, that's completely different to if it's part of their home and they and they live with it and um, interact with it continuously. So at some point, we really do need to think about um, sort of embedding our work within um, within different public spaces and individual spaces and, and doing that um, over time. Um, and... I, I mean, I, I think it's an interesting question, uh, Peg, about longitudinal, because of course it varies depending on what scale you're operating at. So for microbes, longitudinal could be, you know, a month or two months or whatever. For, for us, it might be several years, but, but also the building, you know, we've, we've kind of put this building in the middle of a campus. And that could be there long after our careers are over. I mean, especially mine. But, but you know, so there, so there's this notion of 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 the variance of time, and then who, whose whose responsibility is that kind of long, longitudinal study? So it's a big, a big, and really interesting question to ask of us. Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned it also because I think it is already in your thinking clearly. I mean, you've both given a sense of those two, those contexts. The other one, I guess, I hope I, you know, may be of interest, although it, perhaps people find it more contextual, but is the historical and the sense of how by moving away from some of the kind of standard definitions of scientific endeavor or of architectural subjectivity, then there can be different kind of temporalities that can come in from previous generations and previous practitioners. And I have to say, this is why I find the work of someone like Spinoza very important because it actually is a very, um, it precedes a lot of the kind of foundational concepts of science and technology or of autonomy actually that we sometimes rely on. Um, 
so I would just suggest that that might tie in with the way that you're obviously thinking about process on a number of different scales and um, time spans. Uh, Ruth, you asked a question uh, about this idea of talking about the relationship between art and science. Uh, so this relationship between art and science and what might we gain uh, from that in the HBBE? This is another important area we want to explore. Do you want to say a little more about that, Ruth? Or, um... Yeah, no, I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm always struck uh, uh, about how cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary you are as well in your thinking. Um, and um, I'm just wondering whether you have experience of how art can speak to science. Um, and I mean, it's something that we're thinking about of exploring. We definitely have a lot of artists who are, who are keen to get involved. I'm just wondering, can you talk a little bit about how they might do more than simply represent ideas? So I do, I do think that in some respects, um, there is a way, and perhaps it's about the training again, or the kind of definition of disciplinary knowledge that an artist practitioner may potentially, um, I mean, I have to say this, I'm saying this, there are many architect artist practitioners, I think I would say for, to begin with, but it is a little bit about how um, it seems to me there's there's those kinds of individuals and those sort of approaches that prevent this sort of ob obstruction or the exclusion between science and art. So in a way, I'm talking about examples of individuals where I think Dennis is one of them, where there is a much greater degree of recognition that these are intertwined practices. Um, and again, I think this is the interest that Haraway or um, I would say Carson herself undertook, and it's that you can have artistic scientific practice, practice or technology, but I think it is about a kind of reflexivity. And in some ways, I would say it would have an accord with your point about the sense that the concept of a disciplinary power or an expertise is something that may change and may quite fundamentally need to be reckoned with. And that there is not just this sort of perhaps, um, I mean, I don't, I, I think many of us operate in a much more sort of nuanced sense than some of the kind of scientific methods that we might kind of find we, we ex students expect or feel that the, the disciplines require of them. But I think it is a kind of reflexivity. And I do think it is um, potentially that your uh, physical environment or the conditions of your environment will change and therefore you you adapt into your own practice and perhaps in some ways um, this is one of the affordances of architectural design of the interdisciplinarity of architectural design is that it can recognize that but I do think there's also there are these ethical questions which perhaps are more about some of the communities who are not part of these constituencies where sometimes the artistic community can be much better at recognizing that in some ways there's a relationship to the political that I can see in terms of architectural um, anxieties about market um, viability can be very difficult for people to recognize um, or to engage with and to um, hold to account. Whereas I think that in the artistic um, community, there is um, a facility and a, a sense that that ethical political form is actually part of, part of the critical practice um, that can be held together with it, with other kinds of qualities of, of thinking and making. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question here from Armand. I don't know if you want to ask it yourself, but I'll, I'll read what you've got here. Do you see a peak? Do you see a future where institutions that are gatekeeping and failing marginalized communities can start working for and with the community eventually deconstructing epistemological colonization. Oh, sorry. This is from um, yes. someone else. Someone that, that's fine, thank you. Um, 
So I have to say, I think this is why, I mean, I'm speaking to you from obviously within a COVID kind of framing. And I have to say, perhaps people have found that disappointing, but I have to say, I cannot speak to you from any other context because I think it is so, it is fundamental. It is changing the way in which we are engaging um, on many different levels. But I would also say, and this is something that people may be aware of, UCL, my department is also being asked to address its behavior and its sense of inclusion or exclusion. Uh, with regards to um, uh, sexism and racism. So there is a way in which these kinds of reckonings are taking place. And I, I do mean very seriously that these social requirements that, for example, Black Lives Matter and some of these um, calls for addressing institutional inequality are also very important. And I do think they are ones which actually are really um, really essential. I'm very aware that obviously Newcastle is a very different university, it has a very different constituency, it's a very different regional affiliations and, uh, and uh, many other qualities that are different. But there is a little bit about education in the UK, higher education, where we are very market driven. And these are questions about responsibility of um, access to communities. Um, and of um, education experiences that I think are also really important. Um, I recognise that this is a research conference. Nevertheless, everyone is also very clearly working uh, closely with their um, various student groups. So these are. this is part of this discussion. It is an economic discussion. Um, it's not just going to be done by the energy of a group of architects or practitioners with a, a good idea. This is where this, this um, economic ethics also comes in, which are difficult questions. Absolutely, I'm not trying to pretend that I have the, sort of the answer on that, but I do think we need to be more explicit about it in order to engage with it. Yes, thank you very much. I agree with very much with that. Uh, I think we've got one last question here. Um, biotechnology can be considered as quite coercive as a practice. We see biology as an, an instrumental way. How do we not get formal So I have to say that I I'm obviously speaking to you not as a biotechnological um, practitioner. Um, I agree that it can be seen as a very um, instrumental way. So I would, in some ways, I would say that my, my approach today to contributing to your discussions is to try and suggest that, that these practices that I've drawn from feminists particularly, um, thinkers, are very resistant to the notion of instrumentalization. This is why I'm interested in not talking about different standard ideas of objects or subjects. These are some of the kind of problems of some of the sort of classic ideas of the architect as expert and of author and of their built environment as their object of production. So I would say that this is where I do genuinely think that some of these ethical questions from some of these um, writers and colleagues that I've mentioned are, are of interest and can perhaps counter some of those kinds of drives and um, senses of, um, of power. Thank you very much, Peg. I'd like to, uh, you've given us a lot to take away uh, and to think about, and I know it's going to be very useful for our future work. Uh, I'd like to uh, say thank you again on behalf of everybody.